Let's, uh, as I said, open your Bible to the book of Jonah tonight. I don't actually have a topic name, uh, except when I think about this and reading through Jonah, and it's a short book, of course, although it's a, actually a very powerful story and testimony, um, what the Lord does here. I often think about this and think, you know, uh, it tells us about Jonah and how the word of the Lord came to him in chapter 1, verse 1. And he didn't do what he was supposed to do, right? And I, I don't know if any of you have had that experience where the Lord spoke to you or the word came to you and you felt like God was saying to go do this, but you never really did. And so Jonah then will go through some controversy. Of course, we're all pretty much aware of the story uh, because he took off from the will of God and went his own way, and he ended up in a lot of turmoil, right? And so is a lot of things in our lives. If we go outside the will of the Lord, which here the will of God was to go to Nineveh, preach the word, he said, cry to them, and let them know that their evil has come up before me. And how many times uh, the Lord might speak to one of us or to you where you are and say, you need to let these people know that their problem is that they're sinning against me. And so now God is counting on Jonah to go and warn the people. And if you look at it in reality, it could even be a message to Israel because Israel was called to be the example to all the world and to be the priests of the world and teach us all the things of God. But apparently they got off track. And so in Christ's coming, the Savior, uh, he's come to bring back or redeem Israel. And the scripture talks about that in Acts chapter 5. It talks about why he came and how he came to uh, show Israel their sin. And so we see after Jonah goes through his turmoils, the word of the Lord comes to him again. But why did it come to him again? Do you remember? I know I'm, you're, you haven't just been reading it like I have, so I, I understand that. But in case you remember, the reason was because when Jonah got to the end where his soul was being pressed now in him, he cried out to God. Now, have you ever seen anybody cry out to God? Except they continued to do what they do and go their way. And many times we've done the same thing. We want relieved of the pressure and the tension. But we get to a place where suddenly we realize our words aren't making it. This thing I say I'm saying to God, it's not like he's really responding. And so when we get broken and it becomes a reality, because remember Jonah's down there in the belly of the fish. Remember the guys threw him overboard. They wanted to get rid of him. Uh, it sounds like a lot of things the prophecy about what will come about with the church. People will want to get rid of the church. They'll want to throw it out. They'll want to break our bands and cast off our cords, as it says in Psalm 2. But when you get to the place where you really cry out out of an honesty and a sincerity, and listen, you know, there's a lot of folks that have a problem finding that place. They may have accepted Christ. They may have even done some good things and walked along and so on. But their very surface, even their relationship with Jesus. And that's why we're to keep trying to edify people. You know, like Jesus said, cast in or launch into the deep. You know, you've been fishing over here a little bit. Now I want you to launch into the deep. And so we see Jonah got thrown into the deep. Talks about the uh, bottom of the sea basically and the seaweed and you know he's in there and while he's in the belly of the, of the fish he cries out to God. Uh, we can go through all this and I, I gotta say I left my I had a note sheet I must have stuck it in my other Bible uh, so I don't have any of that with me but it's 
assigned to all of us, Jonah went away from the will of God. And you'll remember maybe that later in the scripture, when he was angry at God, remember finally he went into the city and he, uh, actually it's in uh, chapter uh, 3, if you'll go there. So he's gone through his trouble with the, with the sea, with the fish. They cast him overboard. Um, it says in verse 7 of chapter 2 that my soul fainted within me and I remembered the Lord. So, you know, thank the Lord. Thank God if you are mindful of the Lord all the time. Because Jonah had to get to the place where his soul fainted, which means couldn't do much for him. And he cried out, he remembered the Lord. Uh, prayer came in, under, my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple, uh, and so on. So we look at chapter 3. And so I guess we can say in all of our lives now, you know, there's a term called expository preaching. I mentioned this this morning at a meeting we were talking just briefly. And expository preaching means I preach the word as of what it says. Not how you feel about it or we feel about it. And not about your issue and what you're going through. But preach the word. Jonah was off course with God. And Jonah's reasoning was terrible. Because later he's going to tell us why he didn't obey God. And it's really very absurd, but I know it happens with all of us at times. So the word of the Lord in chapter 3 came unto Jonah the second time. Listen, the priesthood failed. The Bible tells us God had had enough of their offerings. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. We could say that's Israel, but really it's with all of us. And so God is trying to restore what he did in the beginning. And he's finding that none of these things are causing the people to really change. How many times you've been in ministry here? You've been in ministry somewhere else. You've, been, you've listened to the TV. You've heard it on the radio. And you still haven't changed. What does it take? What did we say uh, Sunday morning? Uh, God said, what more could I have done in my vineyard? I got good vine, the best vine I could get. There was good soil. I took all the rocks out of it. I put a hedge round about it. I put a tower there, everything that's needed. What more could I have done? Yet when I planted grapes, I got sour grapes. You know that expression, sour grapes? Mm -hmm. You talk to some people, that's all it is, is sour grapes. Well, listen, in the world, that's one thing. But us who are in Christ, you all, and I remember, I try to remind myself, I'm a new creature in Christ. We confess those confessions on Sunday morning, and we can go and do some more. Uh, I'm a new creature. I'm not supposed to be like that anymore. I'm not supposed to be overrun by everything. I'm not supposed to, you know, serve man, serve man, serve man. He says, I'm a servant of God. You're a servant of God, and we serve him first, right? So the word came a second time. So is it a representation of God calling his people again? Come on, I gave you the word. I'm going to give it to you again now when you finally cried out to me. But then we go all through history. It's for all of us. So you can relate it anywhere. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. In, in the first calling, of uh, calling of Jonah. Verse 2 of chapter 1, he said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. In chapter 3, uh, he's saying, I'm giving it to you again, Jonah. Arise, go, into, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid you. In other words, don't go into the city and say what you're moved by your emotions, 
or the grandeur of everything there, or you know the fear of the king. He said, go and preach what I give you to preach. And in the churches, that's a failure of a lot of us. We're not preaching what he gave us to preach. We're preaching nice messages. Uh, we're not preaching the word as it says. We're preaching the word so it will fill the pews or it'll uh, make the people happy or, you know, keep us from having any enemies. So he said, preach unto it the preaching that I bid you, uh, bid thee. And so Jonah arise. He went to Nineveh. It was a great and exceeding city. They talk about how big it was and so on, 120,000 uh, people or so. And he cried in verse 4, and he said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Only thing is, the people of Nineveh repented. Look at verse 5, and this is what's required in repentance. If anybody, uh, you know, when you're ministering to people or talking to people, and they say, well, what do I have to do? Here's all of it. And then you can go to Acts chapter 5, and it's also written in there because it talks about a repent and a turning to God and working the works of God. So the people of Nineveh, they believed God. Of course, that's the first thing to our salvation, right? We have to believe God. And they proclaimed a fast. In other words, they put that into action. They did works to go along with what they believed. They believed God and proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. What's the word? The word is that preaching that I bid thee back there in verse 2. So that word got to the king. You remember all this, I know you do, and uh, I'm going through it, but I, I just kept reading through this and thinking how much of this is where we really are right now. And if it didn't apply to us whatsoever, the fact is there's a heart motive here with Jonah. You remember in the end, Jonah's mad at God, right? You ever been mad at God? Think about that. Mad at God. And we all have done it in one way or another. Uh, maybe not everybody, maybe I shouldn't say all, but most all have done that at one point or another because it didn't go the way we thought. So God gave Jonah the message and said, go cry to them about this and so on. And so Jonah is thinking, well, in the 40 days, the city's going to be destroyed. It's going to be overthrown. But they threw a monkey wrench into it all. So Jonah already had his heart set on this. In the end here, Jonah's mad at God because, and what does he say? Some of these guys that are preaching that the Old Testament God is not the God of the New Testament. Jonah was mad at God because he said, God, I knew you would do this. I knew you would forgive them because you are always merciful. You're always loving and gracious and so on. He was mad at God because of that. He was mad at God for being the way everybody says today God should always be. Because he always was. Amen. And he always will be. Amen. But unless there's a turning from sin, sin is going to kill every one of us. Yes. Right? So the word came to the king. He went out. They put on robes and Put, off sack, put on sackcloth, ashes. He caused and proclaimed to be published through the city. In verse 7, uh, nobody's going to eat or take food and drink. Then in verse 8, it says, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. And you know, a lot of times we want things to change so bad, and all we really have to do is cry out to God. And if God is not going to change him, He's going to give you such a peace where you are, you will understand this is God. And, you know, we've all had this happen with people we love and that aren't with us anymore and so on. 
but we may say I don't understand and why and everything and we go through all those things and and hopefully and prayerfully we aren't we haven't gotten mad at God but even if we did God forgives us when we repent of course uh, so it says that they cried mightily unto God and this is where I say again a lot of times we say things to God and we do a little prayer to God and we kind of cry for a few minutes because we're so frustrated and so mad but I just wonder a lot of times have we really gone to the place and I'm saying me included of really crying out to God and that's why I would always say when we'd come out here on Saturday nights and pray we pray differently than we do on Saturday morning when everybody's here because we cry out to the Lord about a lot of stuff. And we bring up things that maybe people might not, you know, like, gee, why would you pray that? Or why would you say that? Because it's the same thing as what we read in a lot of the scripture. And remember, there are things God said here about in certain places that you're not to pray for them about that. Just leave it. God's going to have to do what he's going to do. So, it says, yea, let them, in verse 8, turn every one from his evil way. Now, what would happen in our country if from the president to the CIA to the FBI to the representatives and the senators and so on and the police departments and everybody doing everything, there was a decree made that every one of you, I want you to turn from your evil way and from the violence that is in your hands, which represents being in your hearts, the wickedness that's in you. This would take a real crying out. It wouldn't be just somebody saying, well, I'm not going to do evil anymore and I'm not going to murder anymore. That wouldn't cut it. And a lot of times that's what we've done and said we repented of something in reality, we haven't repented like it talks about here. A real crying out. So he says, let every man and beast be covered and cry mightily. Let them that uh, turn everyone, or let them turn everyone from his evil way. And, you know, people quote uh, Second Chronicles 7.14 about, uh, you know, uh, the Lord will heal, heal our land, but even in there it says about turning from our wickedness. And so in everything we're talking about, wickedness isn't supposed to be found in us as the church or the people of God whatsoever. It doesn't mean we're foolish or, you know, somebody tells us things and we just take everything they say as truth and so on. We're to have discernment, right? We're to be able to, be tween, to judge between the good and the evil right and wrong right we're to judge all things the bible says in the manner of discerning between is it good and is it evil so it says let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands who can tell if god will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not and God saw their works. Remember, first they believed up there in chapter in verse five. Nineveh believed God, and so God in verse nine. Who can tell if God will turn and repent from the fierce anger that we perish not? Verse ten. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. We say God knows the hearts of men, right? When somebody who's been into all these things really turns from all of that, God knows. You and I may not quite. Remember when, when uh, Paul came and they knew him as Saul of Tarsus and they said, hey, Lord, this guy, I mean, he's talking to God, this guy who did all this wickedness to the church, to the people, you want me to go minister to him? Think about that. That's pretty dramatic. But God saw their works, so they believed God, 
their belief was followed by works that they turned from their evil. If you go read Acts chapter 5, well, let me see if I, I thought I marked that in my Bible here. Acts chapter 5, or wait a minute, where did I put that? Acts chapter, uh, yeah. yeah, let me take a quick look. It's either in Acts chapter 5 or Acts 19, as I was reading through these things. Uh, Acts 26, I'm sorry, 19 through 20. Yeah, Acts chapter 26, uh, verse 19, Paul says, Whereunto, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles. Thank the Lord it was then to us, right? Then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Listen, this is all through the gospel. Anybody who tells you anything other than this is not telling you the truth. Old Testament, New Testament, it's always the same. So here we are, they believed God in Jonah chapter 2. And again, I'm sorry for, uh, I was reading in Acts chapter 5 also. Uh, Acts 26, verse 19 through 20, if you didn't get that. So God saw their works, they had believed God, and then their works followed, that they turned from their evil, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now, I don't know if you can think of examples of this, but in every one of our lives, remember, we were under the curse of the law. We were living under, in Hebrews, it talks about the bondage of the fear of death. And yet, because you and I repented and believed God and began to do the works that he required, the same thing has been done for us. God has repented of what would have overtaken us. He saved us from it, right? The judgments, the troubles, all the things that go with sin, he's freed us from all of that. So in actuality, because of our obedience, he's repented of what he decreed would come upon us if we continued where we were. Man, that's enough to praise God for right there. <clears throat> but it displeased Jonah exceedingly in chapter 4. Now, what's the proof of who we are? Did you ever just want somebody to get it? Lord, give it to them. God, I hope they get what's coming to them. You're in conversation and, you know, suddenly it looks like they're getting blessed. Well, yeah, I just hope they get what they got coming to them. I know now a couple of times you guys shook your heads. No, that's not me. All of a sudden, are you going to admit that it's us? If you think I haven't done it, I've done it. Probably only once. That's not true. But it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Like, God, didn't I do what you told me to do? Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? In other words, that's what you told me back there when you called me before I ever tried to evade going to Nineveh and so on and got thrown in the water, swallowed by the fish, spit up on the ground because I finally cried out to God and God heard me and God spoke to the fish and said, spew him out on the ground where he's supposed to be. Remember, the fish could have spit him up anywhere. But he took him to where he was supposed to go and spit him up, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
while I was yet in my country. Therefore, now listen, he's confessing here. Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. You know what's a good thing here? Jonah knew the Lord. I wonder, do we know the Lord like this? And Jonah knew the Lord, and he still got mad. Think about that. He knew his personality. He knew his character. He knew what God would or could or might do, and that's what made him mad. Why didn't you thumbscrew him? Why didn't you put him down? Gee, I just had a thought. Of course, a lot of dealing with the Israel trips and the various things right now and people and so on. But our very first Israel trip back in 1976, there were seven of us that went. Uh, We met up with another group, traveled with them and so on. And there was an explosion outside our hotel, a pipe bomb, because there was some controversy way back then. Remember, we were only three years from the war, the 73 war. So the pipe bomb goes off, shrapnel hits my hotel room, which is, we had the presidential suite, my brother and I, and uh, of course everybody was upset with us. We had couches and refrigerators and all this other stuff, and they had regular rooms, and that's where I told you about the story where I hung my socks in the window to dry, And little did I know that my window faced the front of the hotel where the walkway was. And we're walking back from the day and there's my socks hanging in the window. That was my first venture in an airplane and traveling, so I wasn't too smart back then. But anyway, so shrapnel hit our window and we all dove down on the ground and crawled out in the hallway. Well, the other group that was with us uh, after that, the head guy started saying some really crazy things and the, our pastor at the time got kind of mad and he, he blurted back at him and so on. And so we were walking down the hallway after this and he's kind of told this guy off and we're walking along and, and I'm going, way to go, way to go. And he turned to me and said, I need to go back and apologize. And I went, what? <laughs> I didn't think you needed to apologize for anything. I think you were totally right. He said, no, I need to go back and apologize. I shouldn't have done that. And he did. He turned around and went back and apologized. I was mad. (laughs) I thought, man, you really showed him. You really put it to him. Now, I was 19 years old at the time, or maybe I just turned 20. I don't remember. But so this was all new to me in the first place. I'm reading my Bible. I'm not sure how we're supposed to respond or how you're supposed to treat things or anything like that. Over the years, I I hope I've learned a little bit uh, not to act like that. But so I understand this. He said, I knew. I fled before to Tarshish because I knew you're a gracious God. In other words, he's going to Tarshish because he's saying God isn't going to do this. He loves these people too much. And then he shows up some more. So therefore, uh, he says uh, in verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. You embarrassed me, God. I went and proclaimed this, and now it's not happening. We should be glad it's not happening. A lot of times when you have those thoughts, man, they deserve this and they deserve that. Do we remember what we deserved? And do we remember sometimes even now some of the things we do and what we really deserve that God never gives us because he loves us? So take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? I pray these words come to us all, all the time when you get to this place, that the Holy Spirit just brings us back. Is it good that you're mad right now? 
Is it good that you feel vindictiveness? Is it good that you feel you need to avenge yourself when I said, I'm the avenger, God says I'm the avenger? Doest thou well to be angry? Hey, Jonah, is it a good thing that you're mad that I spared these people? So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. So he's still hoping judgment is going to come. But it's not going to come because these people have repented. And then you have to ask yourself, does Jonah understand repentance like this? Or is he sort of, even though he knows the Lord, in his heart is there areas, well, I've never repented like that. I've never, you know, gone into sackcloth and ashes like that. And, you know, when we talk about praying for somebody that we really want to see the Lord work in, are we willing to do that in some areas, to go that deep? So he made a booth, went out and sat under it on the east side of the city uh, to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd. You're all familiar with this. I know you remember it. And made it to come up over Jonah in some of the, uh, in, in my notes, I had some of the NLT version to where it doesn't say really a gourd. It says a vine came up over him and so on with great big leaves that shaded him and so on. But the gourd would represent the fruit of all of that. Um, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. And so the grief here means his discomfort naturally, that it would keep him from being grieved anymore. And Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd or the vines and the big leaves and uh, the dwelling place he was in. So you could kind of say, well, let me finish. We'll go a little further. I'll go back and say what that is. So God in verse 7 prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. So the worm came and bit into the gourd. It ate up the fruit. I think we talked about that Sunday morning with the vine, right? The, the vineyard uh, and planting grass and, you know, about keeping the vermin out, right? So here we are, we got stuff coming and eating the gourd. Now, remember, Jonah is loving the gourd. You ever loved your luxury? You ever love your free time? Ever love your private time, I guess we could say, and somebody disrupts it because they're in trouble? He's loving the gourd. He's loving the vine. He's loving that his discomfort, ah, I'm at ease. Oh, and remember, there's a hot, windy day. It says that the hot wind came and so on. And so he's aggravated by that. And you know, you have those days where it's kind of hard to breathe and you feel tacky because you're just perspiring and you know, you feel saturated in here. And he's saying, but now that the gourd is up, I'm comforted. Came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement, uh, vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die. Seems to me Jonah wants out of life, period, whatever. Whatever, God, just get me out of this thing. Beam me up, Scotty. It beat on his head that he fainted and wished in himself to die. And listen, I fully understand. We were talking today about some grievous things and so on and how you just feel like your heart's, you know, like somebody's got a grip of your heart and it's almost like you could say to yourself, I might, maybe I should just die. Maybe I'd be better if I just die. But remember, make it always, Lord, if it's your will because you don't want to give to the will of anything else. And God always brings us through that. I was talking, it's amazing how stuff just sort of goes along. A lady who said, honey, would you pray for me? I really, you know, I really miss my husband. It's really hard. And she's telling me things and so on. And I said, listen, and I know I can't relate because I've never had your experience, but I can tell you I watched what my own mother went through 
40 years before she passed, when my father passed away and the grievousness. And so I said, you know, some things and maybe you're, you have this, but I said, remember, there's always people that go through much harder things that you and I go through, although they hurt us and, you know, we feel the weight of all that. There's always somebody whose situation, uh, and one day I'd said to this lady, but remember when you told me that your husband told you just two days before how much he loved you? And you even said how he, uh, not coddled, but a word like coddled you and, you know, took such, pampered you. Uh, so so well as so you you felt so comfortable all the time I said do you remember that and she kind of smiled and yeah of course she still grieved and I told her but you can't hold on to that grief it will destroy you so this is all part of it so he's hoping to die and how many people would hope to live on the other hand so he fainted, he wished in himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored. You didn't do anything, Jonah, to bring this gourd about. I did it all. It's not yours, it's mine. You've had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons, that's 120,000, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, which means they have no spiritual understanding whatsoever is what he's saying. They have no discernment whatsoever. He said, you love that gourd. And you know, this happens with a lot of stuff. Do we love that comfort zone more than we love the people? Because Jonah was willing to watch all these people be destroyed, but he's out there praising this gourd and loving this gourd and loving those big leaves and so on and wondering why God would send this worm to eat up the gourd instead of wondering why sin was destroying the people and standing up in that. Is this making sense? Yes. And with all of us, it's what can happen. We could be just like this. It's a warning to all of us. It's a warning to the priesthood. Remember, if this is to Israel, I gave you the word in the beginning. I've given you a second chance. Now do something with it and so on. And for all of us, you may feel like we talk about people being called. They may have been called and they got off track and God is calling us back. Here, let me give you again the word only this time when you preach it. Preach what I gave you to give them. Don't do what you did before and don't go the way you went before. Because if you love the people, what I'm giving them is the best thing for them. Isn't that true? So don't love the comfort because remember, that's what Jonah fell into. I'm being comforted by this vine. It's keeping me from the sun. You know, he was ready to faint and so on. And then all of a sudden it's destroyed. But he would rather have seen the people destroyed. I think we can also look at it in the sense of uh, a system. Would we rather keep the system going or would we rather save souls? Let's say church is an example. I know there's a lot of stuff people saying, well, you shouldn't have a building. and Well, there shouldn't be a pastor. And you know, Jesus didn't say pastor, or some, all this stuff going around, and you know, you should have home churches and cell groups and, you know, group meetings, and you know, everybody's the same in the ministry and all this stuff, only we never see that in anywhere in the order of God. God still has an order, but it means that we aren't, like we talked about the Sabbath a couple weeks ago, 
God created the Sabbath for man, not for man. He didn't create man to keep the Sabbath. He created the Sabbath because men need a day to rest. Men need a day to acknowledge the Lord and spend time with God and so on. And so it's not about you break the Sabbath, well, you deserve to die. No, the Sabbath was made for us so that we would have life and if we'll obey it. So verse 11, God said, And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than 6,000 persons that cannot discern between, or uh, six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle. In other words, there's a life going on out here. In all this, to be very mindful all the time, you know, no matter where somebody's coming from, there's still a soul. And if God would do this and spare them, anybody, you know, we have loved ones, we say to them all the time, if you'll get right with God, things can change. Amen. They want things to change, but they don't want to get right with God. They want this life and so on, and they want to say heaven and so on, and they want to be accepted, but they aren't going the right way of the Lord. Amen. Nineveh would have been destroyed, except they believed God, right? They repented, and then they did the work of putting away their evil. I don't know, are you all still working on that? I mean, every day something happens where, oh my gosh, why would I think that? Why did I want to do that? I'm not going to let that word come out of my mouth. That goes on every day. We're all working on putting away evil, although we've been delivered and set free. Although we're new creations in Christ, although we've been given a new heart, although we've been given the mind of Christ, although, uh, you know, we're renewing our mind through the reading of the word, although we have the Holy Spirit, we're the temples of the living God, right? So, who should we not accept when they want to come? Like uh, we had the one young lady come up a couple weeks ago and accept the Lord and she immediately told me where she's coming from. Hey, that's all right. Doesn't matter. Not a matter of where you're coming from. It's a matter of where you're going. Yeah. That's the important part, part from here. Uh, and the fact that you repent and mean what you say. And sometimes I know that repentance is shallow in the beginning, right? I don't know how many of you, you know, years later, like I said, uh, this goes back a couple months ago. I said about I'm thinking of things all of a sudden I did years ago and saying, Lord, if I never repented of that, I know it was before Christ. I know the Bible says you forgive, but I just want that clear from my conscience that God forgive me for that now that I'm mindful of it. And the other thing that does is the devil can't use it against me because I know I confessed it. I know I'm forgiven. Yeah, I remember what went on. Do any of you remember evil you did? Huh. Sometimes you look at people and it's like you've got to block them out because of all the flashbacks of where we went and what we did and what they did and how this went. Thanks be to God for his forgiveness. So if America could get to the place of believing God, which would mean a lot of what America does wouldn't go on anymore, because now they believe God. And then if they would repent, uh, and then they would take all the evil doings of their hands, and when I say they, I mean all of us, and put them off, we might see God do a great and mighty thing. But you know, if you're preaching how great the country is, and how great the people are, and preaching in the church that you're just wonderful, you're glorious, God is so blessed to have you. How many of you would acknowledge, I mean, I guess maybe I shouldn't ask you to do this. I don't think God's so blessed to have me. Right? I mean, it's just like we, we use the old phrase that uh, one of our old friends used to say, every family that comes to church is a bunch of new problems. God took us in. He took in all our problems. I talked about it Sunday when we talked about uh, Jesus freeing us. He freed us of all of our problems. He took them all. Everything we should have been beaten, whipped, and judged for, 
He took it. Is that right? Yes. I don't know, humility? Is there really humility in the church? And, you know, we may say we're humble and we're, you know, you're so proud about being humble that you blow it. Uh, but we look at a lot of things and think, what, what has happened? We're more about the show. Do you know they, a couple guys put together some videos and they went around to these churches and they videotaped their Christmas programs? Oh my gosh. It wasn't about the humility of Jesus being born in the manger in the low settings of a cave there in Bethlehem and so on. and uh, Just crazy, crazy stuff. It's all become a production. Jesus didn't go around with a production, right? Why did they say this man, you know, preaches as one with authority? There was no show. It was the power of the word that came out of his mouth. The power of his life while he was with us. What he demonstrated, the healings, the miracles, everything else. Nobody did a show. There weren't dancers dancing and setting the stage for Jesus is going to come to the podium now and everything else. The man walked with power in his words. Lord, help us get back to what we're supposed to do. Somebody said if Jesus came, he wouldn't recognize us. Listen, let's leave Jesus where he is because if the disciples came, they wouldn't recognize what we're doing either. I just hope we can get back to that. Preaching the word, the gospel. God said to Jonah and preach that unto them, the preaching that I bid thee. In other words, don't make it up. Don't try to make it fit everybody. When I said, you know, not looking on their faces. I can love all of you. You can all love me. You could get a message from God and be afraid to say it because, well, you're so-and-so or they're my friend or they're my neighbor or that's my sister-in-law, all that kind of stuff. And we're not supposed to do that. We're to speak the word, right? Speak the truth in love. Because we love, we speak the truth. So I don't know, we went through a lot of that in Jonah tonight. I hope you got that. Did I, did I go back and read what it said there? And I did in Acts 26, right? Yes. I read that, so remember that. It's always about repent or believe, repent, and work. There's works. Um, maybe I said this here. I don't know. I've been in two or three meetings with people here since Sunday, but... Uh, a guy preached a message and said, God always pe called people that were working. He called Moses, who was shepherding the sheep. He called David, who was tending to the sheep. And he went on and on. And he said, God never called anybody who was lazy. Everybody he called was busy with stuff. And they dropped what they were doing and came and served him. Where do you think people got this pyramid program thing where you always want to get people that are busy, that have companies, that are known to get things done? You get them involved, they'll get it done for you. And so you tell them, here's the product. You go do whatever you have to do to get them to know the product, understand the product, spend time with them and teach them. Because once they get it, they'll go share it and they will make you lots of money. And here we are, we've got the prize of all prizes, the gospel, the way to the kingdom, the way to eternal life. We need some busy people about the gospel and see them share the gospel so that other people come in. Amen? The harvest is ready, he said, but the laborers are few. Amen? Well, Father, I thank you for this night. Thank you for your word. Lord, you are so good. And this word is life in our members. Whether it lays us out, whether it picks us up, whether it moves us over, whether it seals our mouth shut or causes us to proclaim, Lord, the word is good and thank you for it. I just pray everybody tonight that's here and everybody maybe that will hear this message, listen, if you're in Christ, don't sit on what God has given you. 
Don't let bitterness come into your life like it was sort of doing here with Jonah to where he was angry with God for saving somebody's soul. Thank God that he takes the worst and the least because you and I might have been some of them. And he saves them. He doesn't destroy us. His mercy, his compassion, like Jonah said, I knew thou art gracious and merciful and slow to anger of great kindness and you repent of what evil you were going to allow to come upon people when they turn from their wickedness. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the Lord bless you where you are and, yes. you know, get involved in his work and do the gospel and God will do you very good. Amen. God bless.